A right, quick review time today. Um, the guys at uh, DIY at all in China um, sent me this um, little scope to have a look at. It's uh, DSO 203. I think it's two versions. I think maybe just different um, bandwidths. Um, I was going to give it for just a fairly quick overview because it doesn't really warrant a full in-depth um, review. Just a quick look around, around the outside. Like the um, the DSO Nano products, it's obviously based on an MP3 player casing. You can tell just by the button legends. There's some unused. Um, there's like a flash card socket that isn't actually present. Reset button. In the overall case, it's quite a nice size. It's sort of the usual sort of plastic thing. It's got this little tilt um, tilt stand, so it will sit on your desk quite nicely. That's a nice little um, little feature. As with a lot of these small scopes, it uses one of these, I think these are an SMB coax connector. Now obviously on a scope you really don't want a BNC, but something this small, it doesn't really make sense to have a BNC connector. And I think we may find sort of these becoming more of a standard for smaller stuff. They don't supply a BNC adapter, it just comes with this um, fairly cheap probe, switchable times 1 times 10. No compensation adjustment, but other than that it's a fairly sort of bog standard cheap, cheap scope probe. The spec is 40 megahertz bandwidth, 200 mega samples per second. So yeah, in theory, a reasonable scope spec. And so we've got uh, sort of the buttons which are not not very sensibly labelled purely because they're inherited from the the media player uh, functionality. There's a micro USB here. That's just for charging, nothing else. Which I mean, for a little scope like this, you don't you, USB connectivity isn't really something you need. So don't, I'm not too concerned about that. And again, at the back, you can see remnants of its uh, media player heritage, the, the scope probe things actually still got the headphone socket marking, you've got a microphone socket, a little speaker that's not populated. Um, display is quite nice and bright, um, it's good contrast, pretty decent viewing angle, was fairly typical for a TFT. Oh, uh, one thing, it's got a, um, this is actually sort of shown as a lock unlock switch and this is actually a hard power switch, so if you turn that off um, it does actually turn fully off and disconnect the battery. I'll just quick run through of all the um, buttons and features. This is um, pulls up a menu. Um, the functions is really simple. There's nothing at all complex in here. You've just got this menu that lets you turn on and off um, the the measurements. So go out the menu. Um, so you've got frequency measurements, Vmin, VPP. It will do like Vmax, VRMS, all the all the, the very basic sort of measurements that you'd expect on a, um, a fairly simplistic scope. Menu. Um, you've got English and Chinese menu selections, cursor measurements, uh, trigger mode, auto normal and single. It's pretty much the sort of what you'd expect. Slightly unintuitive. You have to use up, up and down arrows to move across. But um, trigger slope, rising, falling, either and no, none. Not quite sure why you'd ever want none, but uh, you've got the option there. Trigger level. This is a little bit odd. Um, it shows your slider here. And also a corresponding slide. Um, I'm assuming this this marker here is the um, trigger level. So that's just setting um, your trigger level. And that's it. Those, those are all the menu functions. So extremely simple. Um, let's stick a few measurements on. The buttons don't have a particularly good feel on this. They some 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 of them sort of take a. Some of the buttons sort of work more easily than others. Um, so if we just turn them all on, so if you're a mess. Um, the measurements don't see it. When, when you've got this menu up, it doesn't seem to actually run the scope, which for things like setting trigger level is probably a bit of a pain. Um, if we actually try set trend in the trigger level on that. Um, oops. Yes, I mean when you, you really want to have a live display while you're adjusting trigger level and you haven't got it, which is pretty stupid. So we should see the measurements there, um, as accurate as you'd expect on a cheap cheap thing like this. One thing I noticed, the um, the battery indicator always seems to show empty regardless of the battery state, so that's something not totally, um, not totally happening there. For some reason it's actually telling us the language up there, it's a bit of a waste of screen space. One of the more sensible button options you've got the pause and stop is it actually does a run stop so that's acquisition stops and freezes the display. It's also got auto scale which is this button here, you click auto it figures and it mostly gets it pretty wrong and I pressed it twice and it's given me two different results. I'm just giving it a one volt, one kilohertz sine wave, and you know if you can't auto scale that, then it's not going to auto scale anything really. 
um, it's just the auto scale is completely hopeless your basic controls um, you've got this switches this this because here with this um, thing here between Z and M which I'm assuming is zoom and I'm not quite sure what M would be but basically Z is um, in Z mode these are these are just the time base and the side ones just the amplitude and in M mode is a shift so that's a vertical shift in fact you know that that looks like it is actually a zero marker although say it was also moving on us changing the trigger level but the other thing is if I just disconnect the input um, on certain ranges it seems to have rather a lot of zero offset um, if I just change to zoom mode yeah, so I adjust the amplitude. I mean that I don't really understand what that zero thing is doing. It's going all over the place. So yeah, and as you change the amplitude, the zero is just going all over the place, so you have to re-zero it, which is pretty rubbish. The other really surprising thing is this thing does not have AC coupling, it is DC coupling only, which is I mean just totally stupid. These controls are also if you use the, the auto repeat, they're just stupidly slow. If you sort of click it a few times it goes a reasonable speed, but the auto repeat speed is I mean pretty much unusably slow, there's no acceleration or anything, you just hold the button and it just sits there and eventually thinks about it. There is this sort of display here um, which supposedly shows sort of the, which part of the acquisition memory you're showing but one thing that's a bit odd is as you zoom this actually changes so I think what it's doing is it's actually using, if you look at, I'm, I'm guessing this is a sample rate down here, and it's actually using the same sample rate for a range of maybe about five time based settings and just giving you a different amount of the sample memory, which, I mean, there's no real excuse for that. It really ought to, have to change the sample rate to give you the maximum resolution. But, so if I stop that, in theory, I ought to be able to scroll through that. Yes, yeah, so I can sort of zoom in on that. And that is actually showing me which proportion of the... the obviously, it starts aliasing. Um, that's just a pure display alias. I mean, you can see we've actually got the right waveform, but they're not doing any filtering or anything to control aliasing on the display. So you can, in theory, grab grab a, a waveform and zoom in on it. Um, not sure if the manual, yeah, 4K sample buffer size, which is pretty average for a, a low-end scope. Uh, it's also got cursor measurements, but I'm not. I haven't quite figured out exactly how they work. Just turn the cursors on. You get these two X cursors. These side buttons in particular are quite fussy. Interesting when it overloads, it doesn't even go off the screen. It's actually um, there's something not quite right with the input range on here. Um, I've seen it overload at almost at sort of there in certain circumstances. Um, so we've got like a delta T cursor here. Again, when the cursors are on, we get another, as well as the, Z, the Z and M, we now get the cursor one, cursor two. Now we can set the X, but both these buttons seem to do the same thing. So these ones seem to move X, Y, these ones. So it looks like it's maybe only X cursors, and I'm guessing these are the voltage at, the t at those times. But I can't see any way of actually getting any sort of Y cursor, but I mean the vertical accuracy on this is probably not not enough to be worth bothering with. Right, so and it does a sort of passable job at displaying a one kilohertz sine wave, um, although it can't seem to auto scale it for whatever reason. Um, let's just try some other frequencies. Let's see if it's any good at low frequencies. Um, let's give it, um, say, 10 hertz, see what it looks like. So 10 hertz, see if it will auto scale. Mm, no, doesn't seem to like that very much. It's up to the slowest time base, 100 milliseconds set per se 100 milliseconds is the slowest time base setting it does. No roll mode or anything like that. Let's go down to 1 hertz. Yeah, obviously it's getting very, there's no sort of live update, it's just grabbing a thing and then dis then displaying it. The, the buttons still seem to be fairly responsive though, so it sort of just about works, although it doesn't seem to be doing a very good job at triggering that, maybe because we've got the auto trigger mode on. Let's try. See if it'll actually trigger reliably on that. Hang on, let's stick it in normal trigger mode. And yeah, it's sort of showing a weight while it's waiting to trigger, and it seems to be triggering in a fairly consistent way. Let's go back up to one kilohertz. Obviously, it's ali aliasing uh, ridiculously. 
and that's sort of triggering sort of reasonably stably I suppose. There's a little bit of sort of noise on there. Let's go up to high frequencies. So let's try so 10 kilohertz. Slightly unintuitive in that up is making it slower rather than faster. The general convention on the scopes is you turn the time base up it goes faster and this seems to be the other way around. Whereas the, 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 the amplitude is the conventional way around and you turn it up and it gets more sensitive. Again we're seeing a little bit of clipping at the top there. It goes into overload, it's not very happy. Um, let's try a few other waveforms. The square wave looks a bit dubious. The, um, I say there's no probe compensation on this at all, so yeah, there's no way actually to compensate that, that out on the probe at all. Oops, really not getting the hang of these buttons. Again, a low frequency is just a ludicrous amount of aliasing. So that's uh, 100 kilohertz. It seems to yeah, we, we're getting a few little jigglies, but it's sort of okay for something like this. 1 megahertz. This is on the times 1 probe, incidentally, if I stick it on, maybe stick it on the times 10. Now on the times 10 you're starting to see it is getting a little bit noisy and we're getting a few sort of occasional sort of lumpy bits on there. That's 10 megahertz. Now the triggering now the, the way that's cycling suggests to me that there's some sampling going on that's not just I don't think that's noise the way it's actually jittering I think there's maybe some sampling happening so our triggers is just really starting to go out the window yeah I mean the triggering at 10 megahertz is pretty hopeless trying to ramp oh now look at that that is uh, a 1 megahertz square wave so it's not only not triggering but it's overshooting ridiculously so to call this a 40 megahertz scope is it's a joke really yeah, even though it does actually have a you know a fairly reasonable laser to converter the analog front end is clearly just not up to the job and in fact as you change the settings you can see different attenuation settings we're getting different amounts of overshoot and different just general amount, different amounts of rubbishness All right it's 20 megahertz sine wave Again, just very, very jittery trigger. Um, we can also see some sort of straight line segments in there where it's obviously um, sort of using very few samples and just doing a straight line fit between them. So not particularly good. But also, the, yeah, the fact that the zero is going all over the place. And I'm just changing the vertical amplitude. The zero is going all over the place. It's Pretty uh, pretty poor and to be honest I don't really fancy spending a great deal more time on this. I'll just give it something like a video signal to see what that looks like. Right, I'm feeding this a um, composite video signal. This is just a monochrome video signal. Now this has got a DC offset on it. Um, and I can sort of probably offset that a little bit here but because we don't have any AC coupling option the limit to how far that will go. If I want to sort of see that in a bit more detail, I can sort of do it. But we now looks like we're actually clipping at the top edge here. Now we're not seeing anything above that line. And I say we just because there's an input DC offset that really limits on how much detail we can see on this. So it's not really all that useful to be honest. Uh. And this not being able to set a trigger level with a live trace is just ridiculous. It just makes it almost impossible. Well, let's take a look inside this thing. Um, I finally figured out that the screws are actually underneath the display thing. One thing I noticed is actually a logo on the bottom of this display window. They've actually just sort of blocked out with a black felt tip pen. So this is uh, the LCD in the lid. Now the uh, the battery seems to be just held in, sort of with pressure against the PCB and the back case. So I don't really like. There's nothing really to positively locate. I'd like to see either some sticky tape or some foam or something just to hold that in. Um, looks like a pretty standard battery. It's got the pack protection circuit in there, which is reasonable. Um, if 
fairly neat looking PCB, actually surprisingly little on it. Let's take a close look at this PCB. Um, over here we've got a 100 megahertz crystal oscillator with a, quite a long track into the FPGA. It's not really ideal for a track carrying that high frequency. Um, here's the FPGA configuration prom. Um, this will be a JTAG connection for the FPGA. Um, some SRAM. This main um, Altera Cyclone 2 FPGA, EP2C5. Um, this is a microcontroller. This is an SGS Thompson um, STM 8S103 F3P. This is a very low end 8K flash microcontroller. Up here, this is a, a Rayo LCD controller. Um, so this is handling most of the display thing. So this is why they yeah they can use a very low end, uh, low power 8 bit microcontroller because the graphics uh, processor in the FPGA is doing all the all the hard work. So this is only going to be doing some fairly simple user interface stuff. So um, they're using a very low end processor here. Uh, this is a 1.2 volt regulator for the FPGA core voltage. Down here we've got the AD converter. This is pretty standard. It's AD analog device is AD9288, which is pretty standard in all these um, sort of low end um, digital scopes. One thing that makes me a little bit suspicious is that the marking on that isn't quite straight, which sort of makes me a little suspicious as to whether it's a real sort of genuine 100 megahertz part. I mean, the, quite a few companies are overclock the, the cheaper parts. Um, so I wonder if this is maybe actually a remarked overclock part because that you know you'd expect analog devices to actually be able to laser mark their parts sort of straight, but that looks to me just very slightly um, at an angle. Um, there's a HC4051 um, multiplexer here, and just by the way, this looks to me like it's some sort of programmable attenuator. You've got these different resistors um, connected to different inputs of this analog switch chip um, going into the A to D. Um, there's some front end, there's a couple of tri compensation trimmers here. I'm guessing these will be op amps. Can't really tell from the marking for the, uh, the front end circuit. And up here we've got some power supply stuff. Okay, that way. Some power, some various power supply stuff up, up here, voltage regulators. Um, there's an inductor. This is probably going to be for the um, step-up converter for the LCD backlight. And I mean that's, that's pretty much it. There's not really a lot else in this thing. It's uh, you know quite a spacious PCB. It looks like it's um, it's actually a two-layer two-layer PCB by the looks of it. Um, not much on the other side. The LCD connector, a few decoupling caps for the FPGA. Um, the buttons mixture of right angled and vertical buttons, one or two passives here, there's, this is the input connector. Um, I don't like the fact that resistor's right on the pin because flexing of this could cause that resistor to fracture. I'd like to have seen just a little bit of track to mechanically decouple that. Um, that's the on-off switch. I, I broke the, um, the shaft off of that when I first took it apart, so that, that's my fault, but there's a little thing now that's operated by um, an actuator on the, uh, not plastic actuator on the side. Um, that's really it, there's the uh, micro USB socket. So, I mean, very simple, simple unit. And, and the fact that it's using an FPGA in this graphics controller means that I think, yeah, this is quite a good target for sort of hacking, rewriting software, because yeah, pretty much all is all of this is, is pretty well documented. So. You know, you obviously need to rewrite the code for the FPGA, although I mean, you, know, you could get the code as it stands from, from here, but you wouldn't really know, necessarily know how to drive it. Although, and having said that, the, the amount of commands and start stuff coming from this processor can't really be that much. I'm guessing there's maybe an SPI or some fairly simple interface between that and FPGA. So if you really wanted to repurpose it or modify it, you might be able to reverse engineer that and use the FPGA code as is, or you could just rewrite the whole thing. If you were feeling uh, particularly ambitious, it wouldn't take much work to uh, reverse engineer all this front end circuit. There's a dead limit to how much that can be doing. Uh, this is the power supply that comes with it. American style plugs, obviously this comes straight from China, so I, I assume that's those are the plugs they use in China. It's a USB thing. Output 5 volts at 2 amps, allegedly. No approval marks of any sort on there. Let's just take a quick look inside. And... Well, I mean, I've seen better and I've seen worse. Spindly little thin pap, um, connector cables, no EMC filtering at all, cheap crappy paper PCB, only about three and a half millimetres clearance between the live and the um, output. So um, I think there's only one place to put this thing. 
so yet another pretty poor attempt at making a small scope um, it's just so frustrating you know most of the hardware is there it's got a decent ATD quite a nice case quite a nice form factor but it's just pretty useless you know no AC coupling poor user interface I think you know one of the primary problems with every single small scope is the fact that you're dealing with buttons and not knobs you know someone it's not rocket science. Someone ought to be able to make something with maybe a touchscreen interface. So you've got no, cause, you know, the beauty of a, a normal scope is you've got knobs to twiddle. You can quickly get to where you, what you're looking at. Um, and there's no reason why you couldn't. You know, you can get portable devices cheaply with touchscreens. You could make an interface that's got nice, quick, easy, easy to operate controls on the screen. Um, but you know, this is just yet another. Okay, let's make something that looks pretty. It's got a nice, flashy, pretty case. It looks like a cute, cute bit of gear, but it just is not really very useful as a piece of test equipment. You know, a a scope, yeah, a 40 meg scope in this form factor, even with single channel, if it was done properly, would be a fairly nice little you know diagnostic instrument for the situations where you know you need a bit more than a multimeter, but you don't want to cut a full size scope with you. But you know. Yet again, another one that doesn't do it. I've not actually looked at the DSA Nano products. I don't know whether those are any better. You know, this is just another, you know, failure, to be honest. I mean, if you have a need for something really this small and you're not, you know, you're dealing with audio frequencies, it might be okay. For example, if you're, if you're using something like the Veloman HPS 40, it's probably better than that, if only because the display is much better than the, than the um, Veloman. You've got slightly more controls. But you know it's pretty a, a pretty narrow sort of market niche that it'll sell to, to be honest. So um, I'm not really impressed. Doubt it will get used, but if any anything um, significant, someone really needs to try and do this properly. Um, I've yet to see any decent attempts at it. So depressing.